So, <clears throat> welcome everybody. This is the 10th lecture in my course on the Arahant and the Four Truth in Early Buddhist Discourse. I start again with the blog. <coughs> Excuse me. Last, uh, last time we had a look at this detailed exposition of the Four Noble Truths. And in the blog there was some discussion on the there's no sound. Oh, okay, because as far as I can see from here, uh, I should be having sound. Oh, good. Then, then I, I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. <laughs> Perhaps. Something on your computer is not working. Yeah. So I was uh, <clears throat> on the on the four noble truth and on the first noble truth. There was uh, a question about the nature of the five aggregates. Let me just see. There's several other people saying something. It seems everybody except Mark can hear me, so I'll I'll just continue. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> and um, Wayne Cho had asked me to briefly explain the idea of Sankaras. This is the fourth. Menghao also no sound. So there's two people without sound. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I can do something about that from here. Because as far as I can see, I am producing sound and it's also been registered. Well, I think what I'll do is I just go out once and come back in, so maybe that will solve the problem. I just get off and start one more time. Or maybe, as as most of you can hear me, maybe those who, who can't hear me, if you log on again. Yeah, that is the best Hugo. Yeah, that's what we do. Okay, I am with the truth of suffering. <clears throat> suffering due to technical problems and suffering due to various other things. And uh, maybe we can turn the suffering just into Dukkha now. Unsatisfactoriness of computers and equipments. So I'm back to the nature of the five aggregates. Um, the original point of the five aggregates, as far as I can see in early Buddhist discourse, was to point out those particular aspects of ourselves that are most prone to be latched on by identification and reification even. With the later tradition then there comes a slightly different usage of the five aggregates in the sense that they should comprise everything. And then obviously the problem arises that there are certain mental factors, qualities, etc. mentioned somewhere in the discourse and all of these have to be put somewhere. And the tendency then is to use the fourth aggregate, the aggregate of Sankaras, as a kind of header, kind of nice big cupboard where you can put everything that doesn't fit the others. And so in later tradition the actual meaning of the Sankara aggregate becomes a little bit obscure. It's, it's a kind of anything that is not feeling perception and consciousness. 
And it is not completely wrong to put them all there because sang, kara, basically that just means together making or that which is together made, sang, kara. And, and so the idea is anything that is conditioned. But in the original scheme, the point was mainly to highlight our volitional reactions to things, the way how we react, how we react to this technical stuff not working properly, or this monk telling us things that we don't want to hear or we find boring, these kind of reactions. And obviously these reactions influence our mental makeup. If I keep on reacting with anger to technical problems, uh, next time a technical problem comes, chances are I will get even more angry. And so I'm actually forming a habit, a habit of getting upset about technical problems. And this then is a, becomes a conditioning. That is also an aspect of Sankara, and this is in particular relevant for Sankara in the context of dependent arising of Dukkha as the second in the twelve links that we have there in the traditional presentation of this teaching. So there is kind of ignorance and then the conditioned, the ignorant conditionings and ignorant reactions come together kind of in, in one is what leads on to future rebirth and even in the present life to uh, experience of Dukkha. The two contexts are slightly different. The Sankara as the second link in dependent arising is eradicated, overcome and done with by the Arahant. But the Arahant still has volitional reactions. He or she is still able to react and take decisions. And then there is another sense of the term Sankara that has nothing to do with what we have been looking at now, which is just very general, anything conditioned. Even the books you see at the background, the computer I use, the glasses I wear, anything is a Sankara. But this has nothing to do with the aggregates. And then there was uh, a lot of discussion and I thought that was a very important point also on the fifth aggregate, the aggregate of consciousness. The aggregate of consciousness is more simply to explain just this basic being aware of things, being conscious of things. It can be by way of the six sense doors or in the context of the aggregate, it's, it's like the more passive part of the aggregates if passive in quotation marks, that which receives the information that has been processed by the other parts of the mind, that has been felt by feeling, perceived and labeled by perception, and uh, seen in its potential or even reacted to by sankaras, by volition, volitional formations. From the perspective, now coming back to this basic sense of the five aggregates as um, let me call them patterns of identification. Uh, uh, consciousness is the most tricky one, the toughest one. It's the most difficult one to see for the fact that it is conditioned, for the fact that it is not permanent. There was a very beautiful comment by Linda Grace on the blog that I wanted to share with you on this. She says, the faculty of knowing can seem so continuous, ever-present, so much part of me, and thus sometimes not easy to see that it too is impermanent and conditioned. Even some of the practices we have learned, and in fact just the process of reflection itself, can unconsciously encourage this, e.g. being a witness to what is happening in our inner world, so to speak so as to be able to take a step back and not just be swept along and entangled, can, if not understood with right view, further the idea that while everything else is changing, the part that knows can be seen as something separate, permanent or substantial, in some subtle or not so subtle way. Yeah, I think that, that really uh, uh, puts it 
very succinctly and, and right away hits the nail on the head. And this is a problem even in Buddhist traditions. There are several eminent Buddhist teachers and Buddhist traditions who in some way or another propose that which knows or uh, the lucid spaciousness of the mind and uh, similar ideas as something permanent. They, they might not explicitly say it is permanent, but they, they will go so far as to say that it does not change. And this then again, uh, this has its meaning and value within the respective traditions, but here we are concerned with the perspective of early Buddhism. So from the perspective of early Buddhism, this has no foundation. This is not in accord with, as far as the textual scriptures we have at our disposition, allow us to judge with what was thought of the nature of consciousness in early Buddhism. Consciousness clearly is something that also changes and that is conditioned. And this is something I think very important to keep in mind. So before I move on to the next topic, I invite any kind of question or comment on this. <coughs> the statement in the Shurangama Sutra, uh, Rodolfo, has no basis not only in the Pali Canon but not in the entire early Buddhist teaching. The Shurangama Sutra is a very late discourse. And uh, the Chinese version that you are probably referring to is uh, Reckoned Apocryphal, a uh, text that was compiled in China, as far as we know, using the title of a work that, as Juliana Le told me, uh, is known in Sanskrit, Cotonese, and uh, Tibetan. So this reflects a rather late uh, level of thought in the Buddhist tradition and it has no, it, it is definitely different from early Buddhism. I don't like to speak of the Pali Canon, I really like us to speak of like early Buddhism because that is, uh, that is academically and historically more correct. As I think I've been trying to say, I'm not uh, uh, speaking from the Theravada position here, I'm speaking as an academic and trying to show what is early Buddhism, which is relevant to all traditions. Yet I said, as far as I know, the Chinese uh, work that you are probably referring to is apocryphal in the sense that it is not an Indic text, but a text composed in China. So Rodolfo says, okay, he's asking if it's apocryphal and it's fine. And Hugo did you says, is there any link in early Buddhism between the deathless and the knower? There are some scholars who attempt to construct such an idea, which I personally find not particularly convincing. But it's uh, it's 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 not an entirely straightforward uh, topic. But as far as consciousness is concerned, it is very clear that the uh, teachings of early Buddhism in general clearly make it clear that consciousness is always a condition and an impermanent enti entity is even wrong. It is always impermanent and conditioned. And the experience of the deathless is referred to as the cessation of consciousness. Good, then I continue to, there were some comments on the putting the four truth into action. This is Juliana and I thought that was uh, really, uh, putting it very succinctly, uh, 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 this 
something that I, I like to emphasize very much in, as a practical thing, this working with mindfulness and clear comprehension. Mindfulness, the ability to be aware of what's happening by staying receptive. And then clear comprehension, that input of clear recognition, understanding what's happening. And she says that these are not only expressions of right view, but also precursors of right view and wholesomeness. They, they kind of circle around it. And I thought it was really nice and succinctly on, on the practical side. Then there was Mark, which I'm not sure he's, oh, he's there. I hope he can hear me now. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really nice. He gave some practical experience. He describes his work with the Four Noble Truth. So he said, after some practice, the stuff that seemed like short-term pleasure, long-term trouble, isn't so appealing anymore. Used to be I had to remind myself of the consequences. Now, mostly the harmful but pleasurable stuff just doesn't appeal. I think in part it is from looking more closely at how I actually feel while indulging in it, being more mindful. I find the times when I miss that sensitivity and do the overindulging is when I'm going too fast. That's it. Caught up in some frenetic feeling and letting it carry me along. So slowing down and paying attention, or when necessary paying attention as best I can at a faster pace, when life dictates those types of circumstances, seems to do the trick. Yeah, Mark, great to know you're back there with sound, and thank you for this excellent comment. This going too fast is really the thing. This is where we get caught up, and where we start creating trouble, very clearly. Excellent. And Ronaldo, on the same topic. And after that, we have time for question. Ronaldo, when you go fast, there's a tendency of following old habits that lack all those insights, and it is then where you have to remind yourself or make a conscious effort. It is like when skiing downhill, you tend to go over the existing trails. Very nice image. It takes time to change habits that are ingrained. Combine the mindfulness with the slowing down, and you have full power. Isn't that the practice after all? Excellent also. Thank you for the beautiful picture of the skiing downhill. I really like that. Yeah, very nice contributions for practice. Oh, Ronaldo Rodolfo. Oh gosh, Rodolfo, I'm so sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> Somebody has been doing things a little bit too quickly, I think, on this side of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Rodolfo While back in the USA I see Americans are terribly overscheduled, Mark says. Well we just saw that our lecturer he is also a little bit overscheduled. He's not even able to type names properly, you see. <laughs> Don't have to go all the way to the US for that. Now Rodolfo says that the downhill expression was used by the Dalai Lama. And Lisa says the planet is overscheduled. Yeah, it's actually true. Everything is going too fast. Even me. Right, back to our discourse. There was a nice observation by Linda Grace again on Madhya Mahagama 31. <clears throat> she notes that in particular with the Madhya Mahagama 31 description of right intention, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration, just the description of the mental state seems would not be sufficient if these factors weren't already understood more in terms of what they are. I thought that was an excellent observation. It shows, it supports my suggestion that the Pali version seems slightly earlier than the Madhyama Agama, and the Madhyama Agama gives us this impression of this, what I would call incipient Abhidharma kind of thought. Yeah, this concludes uh, Madhyama Agama 31, and if there are no questions, I would go on to Madhyama Agama 32.
I start with a comment by Olga. <clears throat> it's on that, on those birth miracles. In MA32, we read about all those miracle events that took place in connection with the birth of the Bodhisattva. To be honest with you, I find it hard to believe all these miraculous stories we come across in the suttas. And even though I understand that it does not make much difference if I believe it or not, for that is of course not essential, but I question myself, why are all those stories there at all? Are they true? Are they not? If not, then maybe not only those stories are doubtful. So as you see, unfortunately, instead of inspiration, doubt arises in my mind. So what I usually do with these stories, I just drop them off. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say that I uh, had precisely the same attitude as Olga. In fact, this um, Majjama Agama 32, or much more precisely Majjama Nikaya 123, uh, I, I, in my earlier days as a monk, I used to do recitation of the Majjama Nikaya, and I just skipped that one. I just went, pop. <laughs> <laughs> And it was only when I came to study it from an academic side and I made discoveries that uh, I believe have really helped my own and hopefully also the understanding of others about the development of early Mahayana that I began to understand the significance of this discourse. But I, I had the same thing. I, can't, I, I find it difficult to believe in, in, in these miracles. I find them tasteless. And the problem of engaging with them was precisely what Olga says. If these are true, I'm not really at home in this story. And if these are not true, then what about the rest? Here's another comment also by Olga. <coughs> she says, I wish I had more faith, but never mind. I'll be happy with the pragmatic mind I have. I do believe in the Four Noble Truth, and that I think is of much more importance. Believe something that has been tested and proved to be true from one's own experience. And I think there Olga has already given an excellent reply also to this um, problem. I think it is, as from an early Buddhist perspective, it's perfectly fine to be, uh, uh, to not believe everything that is in the scriptures and to have that pragmatic attitude. And there is even encouragement of this type of faith that is based on reason, that is based on investigation. Just as saying, look, this Four Noble Truth, I try this out, it works, so this is something I have faith in. This uh, whole issue of faith is a very complex one. And while I was in the States two weeks ago, I had a longer discussion on that with Sharon Salzberg. And I wanted to recommend a, a book. She gave me one of her books. I don't know if you can see it. Just I just finished it. Faith, Trusting Your Own Deepest Experience. And she has this... Um, saying that... Uh, there's a common understanding of faith that is synonymous with religious adherence. And instead, she proposes that the essence of faith lies in trusting ourselves to discover the deepest truth on which we can rely. And I thought that that, 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 that put it very nicely in perspective. In her book, uh, uh, I, I quickly went through it's like the story of her own faith. And the thing about faith is... You see, in, in, an, in an Asian context, that faith in the Buddha and in supernatural beings is not simply uh, like a little bit of nice cream on top of the dessert that these people like and we don't need it because we don't take sugar, but it is also something that strengthens people. And uh, interestingly, particularly in a meditative context, in fact, that was how we came to discuss this topic with Sharon. You see, in, uh, we have, uh, this is not much being talked about, but in meditation practice, there is always the danger of getting into accidents. Meditation is not always 100% beneficial. Some people suffer after they get into meditation. 
And in such situations, if you have nothing to rely on, it's very difficult to deal with such problems. And there are several situations I experienced as a meditation teacher in Asia where problems could be solved simply by reminding people to take refuge in the Buddha. You see, for Asians, the Buddha is something that, however much they might say, he's, yes, he passed away, he's something very alive in his relics, in the statues, in the recitations, wherever. It's something that is somehow there. And that's something you can relate to. And there's one situation I had. It was a young girl meditating, and she had this sudden thing that there was some external power, that's the way she experienced it, that was pushing her over. So from the sitting posture, she just went, and she was flat on the ground and terrified and crying, and she couldn't get up anymore. And my attendant went there, I couldn't go because that's the female section, and just whispered into her ear in Sinhalese, the Buddha is your refuge. She went up. Just that recollection of the Buddha. I have taken refuge. The Buddha is there. Literally brought her up into normal sitting position again. Obviously we can't do that with a Westerner. And it's also not saying that a Westerner needs to develop that type of faith, that you have to take refuge, you have to believe in all these devas, otherwise please don't meditate. No, not at all. But the thing is, uh, faith, sadda, or confidence, I prefer confidence, is one of the five spiritual faculties, indriyas, and it is needed to counterbalance wisdom. So if somebody develops wisdom through insight meditations, particularly these uh, intensive vipassana type of practices, he or she has to find some counterweight, some, some power, some way of accessing this confidence, faith area that will be a support when the wisdom becomes too much. It won't be uh, believing that the Buddha was born with earthquakes and lights and all this. It's not there. But I just wanted to point out this area of faith which many coming to Buddhists from maybe a religion where faith was uh, experienced as something that is being imposed on you and now you can reject beliefs of Buddhism without beliefs uh, and you have this freedom. Uh, the freedom is definitely there but each of you, each of us has to find some way of integrating this confidence faith issue in, in, in your personal life. It's one can't just drop it off. So there are a few comments here. Rosa Grau, if it can't be seen, it ought not be believed. Yeah, that uh, that if one if one if one 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 need not believe something that uh, goes beyond one's ability to verify, but one also need not reject something simply because one has no empirical empirical evidence for it. One can just set these things aside and say, for the time being, I, I don't know. And this applies even to, to, to I mean, uh, to, to, to things like, like modern physics, uh, uh, discovery of the nature of uh, subtle particles and quarks. Uh, it's something I can't see. And I also appreciate your last comment on faith, but I think there are stages in the practice. Yeah, definitely there are. So I'm fully, uh, Rosa, I fully agree with your, your basic attitude. I'm just pointing out this uh, question of faith and confidence as a mental quality uh, that is part of those five uh, indriyas that, according to the early Buddhist teachings, are required for making long-term progress in meditation practice. And that each has to find his or her own, her own way of developing that quality, obviously not by getting into earthquakes and seeing lights and all these things, uh, but um, just being aware that there is a there's a need that the path to mental freedom in early Buddhist thought is not one of only wisdom. That there is an emotional transformation that 
has to take place concomitantly. And this involves also cultivating a quality that I prefer to use the translation confidence, but the traditional word is actually faith. Juliana Martini. With miracles, etc., I think that as Westerners we may have a certain intellectual conceit that our rational and scientific mindset through which we come to Buddhism is per se better than the traditional mindset that believes. But it's also just a matter of which cultural context medita mediates our experience. Yeah, Julian, exactly. So I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not advocating miracles. But I, I wanted to precisely make the point that, that you are making much, much clearer than me now that, that, uh, wait, no, everything is moving here. Uh, that, uh, that conceit, uh, to question that, that conceit. That, that was precisely what I, what I wanted to, wanted to say. At the, at the conference there, there was one of the participants, he asked about relics. And then uh, Mathieu Ricard was uh, quite strong on, uh, on 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 this point, whereas I would just have dismissed it. I, I really see no point in it. But the the point is really that we should not. We 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 have the perfect. Each of us has the perfect freedom to decide for ourselves what ideas and what images we wish to integrate in our own thought world. But we should be very careful on evaluations where those images and ideas in our thought world are felt to be intrinsically better, more rational, and more meaningful than those other people may be choosing. Yeah, I think I got the point. Thank you, Juliana. Rodolfo, I find the marvelous science related to some determinism that is contrary to the rest of the teaching. The future is uncertain, like a Buddha comes to this world, he reaches Buddhahood in this world. Yeah, Rodolfo, there are, in fact, you're, you're correct. There are uh, some, and I pointed that out in my book on the genesis of the Bodhisattva ideal, there are some aspects where there's uh, of, of this, this developing notion of he is certain to become a Buddha that uh, do not fit very well with the rest of the teaching. And this is precisely what I have used in my book to show the different historical layers. Rodolfo, again, why did you say faith gives support when wisdom is too much? This is a basic teaching of the five faculties, faith or confidence, and wisdom is the first and the fifth faculty, and they need to be balanced with each other. Rosa, confidence is okay, good. <laughs> Juliana, I mean excessive reliance on science or empiricism can be another extreme. Science is just a paradigm, paradigm shifts. To me it doesn't mean much if the Dhamma seems to match contemporary physics or not, just personally. The type of knowledge the Dhamma is about seems to me to be of a different kind. Yeah, in fact. And there's, there's much... Um, uh, the 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 people that are heading in natural science, like Francisco Varela, are really looking at the contemplative science, at the at meditation practices, for an answer to question they can no longer uh, find within their field. Whereas uh, those who are professionally engaged with the study of Buddhism, like in Buddhist studies or Indology we completely dismiss anything that has to do with meditation as entirely subjective and not relevant to the type of study we make. So there's very interesting within two sciences, of which the one, natural science, biology, physics, chemistry, has perhaps a very strong appeal to being very scientific, uh, is actually coming much closer to a um, subjective uh, type of worldview that in... Buddhist uh, studies and theology is still being felt as something uh, that is not academic, not acceptable. Anyhow, <coughs> yeah, this is in subjectivity is scientific. This is the common ground. Yeah, this is in fact what precisely uh, Francisco Varela was very much also pointing out, and what is becoming more commonly understood in. Uh, natural sciences that there is not really this objective observer out there 
but there is always an element of subjectivity involved. Anyhow, <coughs> I think I continue at this point because there's still something. This is by Rodolfo, not Ronaldo. <laughs> I have faith that meditation can give me insight because of small samples I obtained. So I have faith in that. We have faith, but of a different kind, and Buddhism, with its flexibility, can accommodate us well. I thought that was, again, very uh, putting it very nicely. And that is, that is, that is reasonable. That is uh, Pali, they call it Akaravati Sada. Reasonable faith. A confidence gained from experience. I tried, it worked. So I, I, I have faith, and Buddhism, early Buddhism, can can accommodate that as much as the traditional uh, uh, Buddhist who believes there was indeed an earthquake and the devas came, received the Buddha, etc. There's one more comment by Mark, and then there would be again time for questions. <coughs> He says, if we are skeptical, we have to be true to ourselves, but also respect the faith of our fellow believing Buddhists if that is part of their path. Very beautiful. And I think even for modern people, if we can temporarily set aside our rational objections and just enjoy a good story, we can find great symbolic meaning in these stories. And that is also a very good point. So one, everybody has the right to, to be skeptical, but uh, we also, as Giuliano already pointed out, we, we shouldn't be condescending towards those who have a different approach. And uh, if, we, if we do not, like in my own experience, at the point when I set aside my objections against Majjhima Nikaya 123, the parallel to the story of the Buddha's birth, I started to enjoy and understand the story and I made a major discovery. I really it I really paid off. And uh I think if I'm now I'm always reading the Agamas and not the Pali, but if I would be starting to read the Majimanikai again, this time I would be able to read uh the entire collection. I would no longer feel I have to jump this part. Hmm. <laughs> time for questions. <coughs> No questions. Hmm. I have no faith in that. Good, then we hit the Madhyama Agma 33, and as you may have already been suspecting on seeing the screen, I'm not going to say much about this discourse. I'll just present it briefly to you. Uh, this discourse does not have any parallel. And it seems to be putting together of different pieces that are related to Ananda. <clears throat> this is an interesting tendency in several discourses of the Madhyama Agama, where we find what I think are the beginning stages of literature that later came to under the Avadana type of literature, where we uh, first there's this interest in the Buddha and this history of the Buddha that we get in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta and its parallels. And then there begins to be an interest as time passes by in having some history of his chief disciples. And so there are these discourses which collect different pieces on a particular disciple and at the beginning of a kind of a history as we get later on in the commentaries and in Avadana literature. So the Madhyama Agama 33, I just give you a brief overview uh, about uh, the main points in the discourse. <coughs> The Buddha tells that uh, he is old and he needs an attendant. And then there are different uh, monks that volunteer and the Buddha does not accept them, mostly because they are also as old as he is. And then Mahamogalana realizes that the Buddha wants Ananda as his attendant. So Mahamogalana approaches Ananda and Ananda at first hesitates 
And then eventually he agrees to become the Buddha's attendant under the condition that he will not be getting any special privileges from this position. And then the next part of the discourse, the Buddha uh, declares several ways how Ananda is looking after him in a very skillful and appropriate way. And then there comes another section. It's very clear that these are different textual pieces where Ananda declares himself what are his outstanding qualities. You remember we are in the chapter on marvels and wonders. And then there's an interesting feature that we are going to come to in the next discourse, which we'll discuss in more detail, where every time Ananda says something where he is good at, then the reciters repeat that, repeat the same quality. Then comes another section where the Buddha teaches Ananda about the proper way of lying down on the right side, the lion's posture, the idea of a lion who sleeps on his right side. Then comes another passage on the Buddha's passing away, and Ananda is preparing a place for him under the twin sala trees. And then there is this uh, touching scene where Ananda is standing outside weeping because the Buddha is about to pass away, and he realizes, Oof, I still have so much work to do and the teacher is not going, not going to be there to help me. And to cheer him up then, the Buddha extols several of his qualities and compares them in the Madhyama Agama to the qualities of a wheel-turning king. Wheel-turning king is a universal emperor. And then comes an episode after the Buddha has passed away and there's another monk by the name of Vajiputta and he realizes that Ananda is not yet an arahant, so he speaks a few poetic stanzas to, to stir him up. That would, I think, be Sangvega, the term we were discussing with Venerable Kinchana. And when Ananda is about to lie down on his bed, he becomes an arahant. And the story of Ananda get, becoming an arahant when he is just about to lie down to sleep, to take a rest, we also have that in the Theravada tradition, the Vinaya where this is uh, said to have happened just before the first uh, council, Sangiti, or communal recitation, where according to tradition, the scriptures were rehearsed. Yeah, that is my brief rundown of Manima Angma 33. Let's see if there's any question to that. Hugo, any comments about what I read from Ajahn Brahm on the translation of Madhya Nikaya 141, having put away covetous and grief for the world? Yeah, Hugo, I think Juliana very clearly replied to that, and I can only endorse that. I have also stated that in my Satipatthana book, and uh, I think we also discussed it last year. Once again, it is not possible to assume that the five hindrances need to be overcome before Satipatthana practice because Satipatthana practice includes awareness of the presence of the hindrances. But this is a topic that has not really so much to do with the present lecture and I would prefer if we can stay with the topics that are somewhat related to what we are discussing now. If there's no um, comments or question on this, uh, my short rundown of the collected stories on Aranda, I would go into Madhya Magma 34, which is the discourse that is the main topic for our meeting today. And where I have already earlier announced that in the, the first part of this series, we have been looking at uh, Sariputta as an exemplification of the early Buddhist Arahant ideal. And in this discourse, we get what I think is a somewhat different Arahant ideal. And I think this is what I would like us to particularly look at now. <coughs> so the setting of the discourse is that. Uh, there's this monk called Bakula, and there's an old friend of his who is practicing in a non-Buddhist tradition, <coughs> and he comes to visit him. Uh, just a second, there's one uh, question by Juliana. Is there a canonical basis for the story that he attained Arahun just before the first council? Juliana, it's in the Vinaya. It's uh, in the Vinaya uh, account of the first council. 
<clears throat> so yeah I think I read the first part and then I want to make you notice certain features of this discourse and then we'll read the whole one and then we look at these qualities <coughs> excuse me the non-Buddhist practitioner asked, Friend Bakula, how long have you been practicing the path in this true teaching and discipline? The Venerable Bakula answered, Practitioner of another school, I have been practicing the path in this true teaching and discipline for 80 years already. The non-Buddhist practitioner asked further, Friend Bakula, during your 80 years of practicing the path in this true teaching and discipline, do you recall ever having had sexual intercourse? The Venerable Bakula answered the non-Buddhist practitioner, You should not ask such a question. Instead, you should ask a different question. Friend Bakula, during your 80 years of practicing the path in this true teaching and discipline, do you recall ever having given rise to any thought of sexual desire? This practitioner of another school is the question you should ask. Then the non-Buddhist practitioner said this, I now ask a different question, friend Bakula. <coughs> During your 80 years of practicing the path in this true teaching and discipline, do you recall ever having given rise to any thought of sexual desire? And this, because the non-Buddhist practitioner asked the question, the Venmal Bakula said to the monks, Venmal friends, I have been practicing the path in this true teaching and discipline for 80 years. But that for this reason conceit should arise in me, this is not the case. That the Venerable Bakula was able to make this declaration, this is said to be an extraordinary quality of the Venerable Bakula. Again, the Venerable Bakula declared, Venerable friends, during my 80 years of practicing the path in this true teaching and discipline, I have never had any thought of sexual desire that the Venerable Bakula was able to make this declaration. This is said to be an extraordinary quality of the Venerable Bakula. So now we look at the Pali version. There is the same thing also, the same exchange that happened before. And then our Bakula states, I do not recall any perception of sensual desire to have ever arisen in me. And we get this uh, comment by the reciters that in the 80 years since he went forth, the Venerable Bakula did not recall any perception of sensual desire to have ever arisen in him. This we remember as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Venerable Bakula. And then it continues like this with always these repetitions and I'm just giving you his basic statements. He also then states, <coughs> in the 80 years since I went forth, I do not recall any perception of ill will to have ever arisen in me. And in the 80 years since I went forth, I do not recall any perception of cruelty to have ever arisen in me. And then again we get this for just the same type of thought, sensual thought, ill will, thought of ill will and thought of cruelty. Now the first thing I would like us to notice is this, this, this type of acclamations that we get in both versions, like this that in the 80 years he did not, this is a wonderful and marvelous quality. <coughs> this is something uh, uh, relatively unusual in the uh, early discourses collected in the Chinese Agamas and Pali Nikayas. Usually the reciters, those who uh, put the discourse into its final shape for oral transmission and eventually writing down, they will give locations. They say, like, the Buddha was staying here. Or they will say, so-and-so said this part, and give us the name of the speakers. They sometimes give a little narration to connect pieces that have been, there's, there's something that happened in between, like they say, so-and-so got up, and so-and-so came. But normally, uh, they do not, make this explicit approval, they do not express the explicit approval in this way and as far as I have been able to research this so far, I have found these kind of approvals always in discourses that have later features. And uh, it, the 
point of these approvals is not only uh, that it uh, could be a sign of lateness, but also uh, it shows that from the perspective of the reciters, this Bacula is really exemplary. He, his, his marvels are really, really very important to be, to be kept in mind and, and to be emphasized. And then another point that uh, comes uh, from the statement that he has gone forth for 80 years already is uh, that obviously this discourse could not have happened at the time when the Buddha was still alive. That is leaving aside now uh, our academic perspective and uncertainty how far the discourses report actually what happened, even taking the discourse at its surface level and just going by what it says. When it says 80 years since I went forth, then uh, it is not possible that the Buddha could still be alive because our Bakula could only have become gone forth as a Buddhist monk after the Buddha had become awakened. And uh, that means that after 45 years the Buddha passed away, getting up to 80 years, it means that this statement could have been made at its earliest, 35 years after the Buddha had already passed away. That also means that it is impossible for this discourse to have been recited at this first uh, communal recitation or council, the first Sangiti. In fact, the commentary, the Pali commentary recognizes that, and it says, yes, this discourse was included in the canonical uh, collections only at the Second Council. So, what I wanted to draw our attention to here is that now as we are going through these uh, qualities, that what we have here is, first of all, uh, clearly a discourse that itself identifies as being later than other discourses, and that it is some discourse that shows us qualities that the reciters apparently found extremely inspiring. Robert, <coughs> I wonder how Bakula could be so far on the path, no sensual desire, from the very first moment of going forth. For most people, the tendency to craving ignorance decreases over the period of the practice. Well, uh, I hope I'm not being too naughty against good Bakula now, but according to the commentaries, and I believe I also found that information in the commentary preserved in Chinese on a Kotarik Agama, Bakula was already 80 when he went forth, so he was already an old man, and by the time of this discourse, then he was 160. <clears throat> And also, but we have a similar statement also for Ananda, that he can also claim that he never had any perception of sensual desire. And so it seems that some people uh, are less disposed towards sensual desire. I myself know some lay people who uh, have uh, never had engaged in any sex because it simply didn't interest them from the outset. And these, these, these people, if you meet them, they're all practicing Buddhist those I know, they, they make a very pure impression on you. So I, I think it's just a question of what we bring with us when we start the practice. But for most of us, certainly myself included, I cannot make any such claim. To the contrary, I really had to struggle when I became a monk. <laughs> Sylvester, <coughs> can it be that Bacala was an alien? Sylvester, I'm not sure what you mean by him being an alien. He was definitely a Buddhist monk. Yeah. Maybe if you say something more, I'm sorry, I didn't get that point. And Rosa understands Anul then at 160. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Juliana. Why does the non-Buddhist practitioner word the question in terms of this true teaching and discipline of another teacher? Is it normal, just referring to the way the Dhamma Vinaya of the Buddha was known? Is he adopting the Buddhist expression for the sake of discussing with the Buddhist practitioner? Or is it a slip in the transmission? Well, true teaching translates sad dharma. So, 
I would think that uh, maybe the original expression he might just have used Dharma Vinaya as the expression Dharma Vinaya is being used regularly also outside Buddhist circles and by Buddhists to refer to non-Buddhist traditions and then this became Saddharma Vinaya. Let me just check the Pali. If there's also Saddharma, maybe there's also Dharma Vinaya. Yeah, there's nothing there. Yeah. So, there is no Dharma, no Vinaya in the Pali version at all. So, I don't think this is a problem. This is just a, an expression that came to be part of the Madhyama Agama version during oral transmission. I suppose. Rosa says they are joking. Sylvester Schrieger, not a human being. Why, Sylvester, you think he would not be a human being? I, as far as we are able to tell, Sylvester, this is just a very normal story. Uh, that is meant to describe a marvelous monk, just as other marvelous monks we, we met before Ananda, and we'll be meeting some uh, marvelous uh, lay people uh, next time. <laughs> Rosa, no, seriously, in my opinion, this is highly hyperbolic, literary, nothing to do with faith or no faith. Yeah, I think I'm losing the thread a little bit of the different comments. Juliana says that he could not have ordained if he wasn't a human being anyway. And John Emma says, does go forth always mean as a Buddhist? Or can one go forth as an ascetic and later become a Buddhist? I'm thinking of a story in the book we use for the Dhamma school here about the ascetic Asita and his nephew Nalaka. At Gautama's birth, he asked his nephew to retire from worldly life and become a monk for the sake of the future Buddha. Though I know this book uses many things from later periods in the development of Theravada. Yeah, going forth in general just refers to uh, to to anyone, not necessarily as a Buddhist. But the context here makes it obvious that Bakula is a Buddhist monk. There's a paper on going forth by Freiberger where he discusses that. <clears throat> There's a few passages where I found that somebody who had already gone forth as a non-Buddhist I do not recall now, I think it's more often in Chinese Agamas than in Pali versions, that uh, then he gets a, gets a talk by the Buddha, and he gets faith, and then he says, let me become a lay disciple. And there I argue that this, this makes not much sense, that either he, uh, he is not convinced by what the Buddha teaches, or if he is convinced, he'll become a Buddhist monk. Shweda Bakula is really an unbelievable story. Yeah, Sylvester, but that is a little bit, I mean, this whole chapter on miracles now, uh, what we are looking at is uh, not so much whether this is believable or not, but we are trying to see tendencies in Buddhist thought. And these tendencies have had an influence far beyond the Bakula story. And there is a a shift, I believe, in the conception of what uh, makes an arahant praiseworthy, which informs modern understandings, particularly in the Theravada tradition, much beyond this Bakula story. And this is what I'm trying to get at now. <coughs> so, we are continuing. I am listing these uh, qualities. I'm numbering them according to how the discourse presents them. The Madhyama Agama often puts several qualities together and then only gives this uh, statement by the reciters uh, that uh, 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 it's a one, one marvelous quality. The Pali uh, cuts them up in smaller pieces. <coughs> Excuse me a second. <coughs> I have been wearing rag robes for 80 years, but that for this reason conceit should arise in me, this is not the case. I have been wearing rag robes for 80 years. I do not recall ever having accepted a robe from a lay follower. 
having cut up cloth to make a rope, having had other monks make a rope for me, or having sewn a rope or bag with a needle, not even a single thread. I have been begging food for eighty years, but that for this reason conceit should arise in me, and this is not the case. In my eighty years of begging food, I do not recall ever having accepted an invitation from a lay follower, excuse me, ever having gone beyond the right time for begging food, ever having begged food from a big household so as to get clean, good, very fine and luxurious food to eat, save and digest. This coming back to his conceit is something peculiar to the Madhyama Agama version. The Pali version, and I'm cutting this up to make it a little bit, hopefully, less boring into like topics. On the topic of robes, it gives us the following uh, marvelous qualities of Bakula. So he does not recall ever having accepted a robe from a householder, having worn a robe given by a householder, having cut a robe with a cutter, having sewn a robe with a needle, having colored a robe with dye, having sewn a robe at the Katina time, having worked on making robes for my companions in the holy life. Oh, there's the meal also. Having accepted an invitation to a meal, having given rise to the thought, oh, may someone invite me to a meal, having sat down inside a house and having eaten inside a house. So we get all this um, austere conduct in the two versions related to robes and food. Two quite central topics for monks. Let me see what Mark has. If the commentaries were wrong about him already being 80 years old when he became a monk, then the story is quite believable. The discourse itself makes no such claim that he went forth when already 80. Yeah, Mark, that is true. But as I said, this uh, commentary explanation, I found it again, and I do not recall often now where, but I could look it up. And I believe it is in the uh, in, a, in a partial commentary preserved in Chinese on the Ekotarika Arama, where we also told that he was 80 years old when he ordained, or we are told that he was 160, he became 160 years old, which is a little unbelievable. Yeah. And as you rightly point out, we do not get any statement in the canonical versions, be this the Majjhima Nikaya or the Majjhima Agama, that he was 160, that he went forth only at 80. So this is only a, a later point, and I was just mentioning this to give some uh, background, uh, uh, smilingly perhaps, uh, on the fact that he is presented as having had no sensual perceptions. Now we get into women. How is he dealing with women? Oh, Bakula. <clears throat> My dear Mahagama, I never looked at a woman's face. I do not recall ever having entered a nunnery. I do not recall ever having exchanged greetings with a nun or even having spoken to a nun on the road. During my 80 years of practicing the path and this true teaching and discipline, I do not recall ever having trained a novice nor do I recall ever having taught the Dharma to a lay follower, not even a verse of four lines. I'm obviously leaving aside all these repetitions and acclamations. So his conduct with women and with other monks and lay people. Let us see what the Pali version says. I do not recall ever having grasped the signs and features of a woman, having taught the Dharma to a woman, even as much as a four-line stanza having gone to the bhikkhunis' quarters, having taught the Dhamma to bhikkhunis, having taught the Dhamma to a female probationer, having taught the Dhamma to a female novice, having given the going forth, having given the full admission, having given dependence, having had a novice wait on me. A female probationer is a specific stage in training for becoming a bhikkhuni, Going forth as for becoming a male or female novice, full admission is then for becoming a bhikkhu, and one lives in dependence on a teacher. So these are all uh, terms related to the monastic training in early Buddhism. Let me see. <coughs> there. Oh, I thought there were some more questions. Something was moving there, but nothing has come.
Oh, there, Mark. Asians like to embellish age, long life like as wisdom, but being a monk for 80 years is quite possible, and also the strict practice, remarkable but possible. Yeah. Rosa is joking. Yeah, and Juliana is, as in the meantime, as you always, very good at finding the reference. So it's in the commentary on the Ekotarika Agama, the Fembie Kongdalum. No, no problem about multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank you very much for, for supporting. I suppose if you had found out said something wrong, you would not have posted it, no? <laughs> yes, Rosa, that is in fact the full point that I'm wanting to go for after I've read through this. Are all these things that deserve admiration? That is the big question that I have. You hit the nail on the head for me. Let's 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 go through the whole thing and and then discuss. But I I fully agree with you. Lisa says it's more the point around seclusion. No. Hmm. Let let me get to the end. But that is a question I also had, and eventually I I was not so sure about that. Let let's let's go for the for the rest and then but uh, I think yeah in fact as Rosa says non action is not so good and uh, the topic about seclusion is uh, we I, I would like to comment on that well let, let me comment on it right away to, to clarify things actually maybe that's better so the thing is you are correct and I will be hopefully not repeating myself when I say that again later on if he would have been somebody who lives entirely in seclusion, that would be understandable. But everything we know about him is he's living right in the middle of the monastery. At the time of a chance meeting with a non-Buddhist practitioner, he starts to address the other monks. It means he was in the midst of the monastery. And at the end we get another passage where he passes away again. He's in the midst of the monastery. So, as far as we are able to tell, the picture of Bakula that we are getting depicted in this text is not one of somebody who is simply in seclusion by himself. And that is precisely why I fully agree with Rosa. Are all these things that deserve admiration? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Hmm. Any let us let me let me go for the rest. <coughs> it's not so much more, I think. During my 80 years of practicing the path and this true teaching and discipline, I have never been ill, not even having a headache for a moment. I do not recall ever having taken medicine, not even a single piece of mirabala. In my 80 years of practicing city meditation in the cross leg posture, I have never leaned against a wall or a tree. Now we get uh, the Majimanikaya version on his, uh, what we call it, body care. I do not recall ever having bathed in a bathhouse, having bathed with bath powder, having undertaken the work of massaging the limbs of my companions in the holy life. That's actually a question, uh, reply to a question asked one or two lectures earlier, if monks are allowed to massage each other. Excuse me, continue. Having had an affliction arise in me for as long as it takes to milk a cow, that's a very short time, having taken medicine, even as much as a piece of gall nut, having used a bolster, having made up a bed, having entered upon residence for the rains and resting place inside a village. Mm. Po Hui is asking if Bakula was too old to remember things correctly. Po Hui, ni si Po Hao, you are naughty. <laughs> So we continue with the uh, Robert. I find points twenty one FF even discriminating. Twenty one FF. Now I have to go back to see what he means. Yeah. In fact, I do too. In any case, the Buddha did not make a difference between male and female for us. In fact, I also find them discriminating.
<coughs> so I keep reading the Madhyama Agama. Within three days and nights I attained the threefold realization. I will attain final nirvana in the cross-legged sitting posture. Then the Venerable Bakula attained final nirvana in the cross-legged sitting posture. That the Venerable Bakula attained final nirvana in the cross-legged sitting posture, this is said to be an extraordinary quality of the Venerable Bakula. And the Pali version, for seven days after going forth, I ate the country's alms food as a debtor. On the eighth day, final knowledge arose. Then on a later occasion, the Venerable Bakula took a key and went from cell to cell, saying, Come forth, Venerable Sirs, come forth, Venerable Sirs, today I shall attain final Nibbana. Then, seated in the midst of the Sangha of monks, the Venerable Bakula attained final Nibbana. This is a small by the side thing, this taking of a key. I have always been puzzled why they have to take a key to go to the places of others. There's a very, uh, very nice study by Professor von Hinüber of material aspects of monastic life. And so he explains that these uh, ancient type huts, they had a kind of lock that you could only open and close from inside. So like suppose I go into my little hut, then I have uh, like something that enables me to close the door, which will prevent wild animals and snakes from coming in. But if somebody wants to close it from outside, even when I go begging or somebody else wants to give me a message, they have to have a little metal hook kind of. There's like a hole, you put that hook in and that enables you to pull up uh, the wooden part that is closing the door. So in order not to disturb those who are meditating, they have this key, this buckler takes this key so he's able to go into all these huts and say, uh, I have a message for you, and then tells them to come. That's just a little little material thing because that has always been puzzling me a lot and Professor von Hinüber's explanation uh, solved that puzzle for me. John Emmer, didn't you mention in your paper on Bakula that he didn't teach males either? Yeah, yeah, he also doesn't teach novices and shamanists. We're going to come to that now. But that he makes a special point of being proud, that he never speaks to women, that he never even greets a nun, I find that discriminating. So now we have a look at the different topics. First, there is this um, issue of the perceptions he has, and there's this recurrent emphasis in the Madhyama Angwajan that he has no conceit. And I simply question if the fact that uh, he is has to this has to be stated explicitly. There could have been some criticism. Uh, I, I just wonder, could there have been some criticism about the fact that he is saying, I have this, 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 this? And as we can see also, there's a typical way how things expand. Uh, I think the original would have just been that he had no central perception. And then the uh, party version, ex this, this expands, no ill will, no cruelty, and then you have three types of perception, then you also get the three types of thought. It kind of becomes uh, more voluminous. Here we have the topic of robes. Let me just see the comments here. John Emmert says, I took it as evidence of his lack of interest in sexuality. Yeah, but uh, John, if I am... If I know where to teach only males, I would make it a condition for this course that no females are allowed to come and listen to this. Uh, would you feel that this is an expression of my lack of interest in sexuality? Uh, sorry for being a little provocative, but I, I, uh, I find in fact that precisely because I'm I have really worked on my sexual design, I've really diminished it. I feel extremely comfortable teaching women. And I find this is, this is very important. It shows uh, a, a level of maturity to me, it seems. And besides, as Rosa said, uh, uh, if you don't teach, that's a lack of compassion. And Lisa says, ignoring others' bikunis and looking at a woman's face if you're a bhikkhu could be cruelty. 
Yeah, I mean, if 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 I have a problem with sexual desire, it is meaningful not to keep a uh, too much uh, close look at women because men are used to latch on to certain parts of a female and then develop sexual fantasies. But uh, somebody who has been a monk for so long and boasting of that, hmm. John says, no, but I, since he didn't teach males either and given the context of the initial question, I thought he was just elaborating on his lack of interest in women. I still feel that uh, the emphasis given here fits with a general tendency towards somewhat misogynist attitude in the Buddhist tradition, and the fact that these qualities are then being uh, emphasized as something very praiseworthy of somebody who is an arahant. This 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 monk, according to what he says himself, has been an arahant since a few days after he ordained. So for an arahant who could not have had any sexual desire to completely cut off women and bikunis from the picture is tough to believe tough to understand what makes this coming back to rosa how can this be praiseworthy there's a story of uh, ananda and he was not an aran he was just a stream enterer and the buddha sent him to uh, uh, give teachings to the harm of the king now the harm of the king, these are the most beautiful women you had at that time. And being there, surrounded by these pretty women, and Ananda was just a stream enderer. So if that was felt to be appropriate, then how can an Arahant monk pray, be praiseworthy for the fact that he does not even speak to a bhikkhuni? I I I just I just find this uh, uh, this depiction of a different arahant ideal from what we have been meeting so far with Venerable Sariputta, and that this uh, this 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 shows this is precisely the importance what I was saying before to Sylvester that this discourse shows tendencies the beginning of certain tendencies that have been very influential. And it is very important to recognize these tendencies, I believe. And this is why I, I have nothing against poor Bakula, and I, I don't have anything against the, the discourse as such. I'm just trying to pinpoint certain tendencies which I think are problematic, not only evaluated from a modern Western perspective of gender equality, etc., but also just placing them within the context of other early discourses. Rosa says, for misogyny, please read the Jatakas. Yeah, the Jatakas are... But the Jatakas are not originally Buddhist. Many of them are from a general Indian background and have been incorporated in Buddhist literature. So, Juliana said aside that he's an Arahant. Generally speaking, it may as well be a sign of aversion due to fear that is desire of women. It would be, Juliana, if he would not be an Arahant. Yeah, as Rosa said, that would actually be a sign that he has a lot of desire. Uh, John Emma says it's a good point. Rosa Grau asks if that's repression. Juliana, there's even in modern context a lot of rhetoric about misogynist behavior taken as a sign of asceticism. That is precisely, Juliana, what I'm pointing to. That is precisely what I what 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 I want to get at. This this the idea uh, we sometimes get in some parts of the Theravada tradition of the Arahant, uh, who just displays outer asceticism. And I believe it has its roots in this type of uh, issue, this type of description. Lissa says, there's a distinct reverence for lack of engagement in his community generally here, which is perplexing. In fact, yes, aside from the gender issue, it is. So we look at the robes. <coughs> there's a problem here that it's difficult to see how he could have been wearing robes of course, he doesn't, he doesn't take robes that are given to him. He also doesn't want to sew them. And he never, according to Majima Nikai, he never even dyed them. It's a little difficult to understand. And there's a, it's a cute story in the party commentary. It says that his relatives, they would, uh, they would make rag robes and dye them. And then whenever he went to take a bath, they would sneak in take away his old and put in the new ones. 
and this is how he could keep on wearing robes without having to accept them and without having to make them. Yeah, I, 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 it's it's a it's a sweet uh, one of these um, commentaries trying to make sense out of a somewhat uh, difficult description in the suttas. I think it, strictly speaking, would still be a case of accepting a robe from a householder, since even though they just put them there, they were made by them. And it means also, if he puts them on after bathing, that means that he accepts them. Anyway, he, what, however he got his robes together, it is clear that he got them in a way without collaborating, and certainly without collaborating for others to get robes. And this is a way of conduct this and other aspects of his conduct where I always think like if all monks would have been acting like this the uh, order of bhikkhus would have died out very quickly. Let me see some of the comments here. Mark, maybe was a naked ascetic. <laughs> Rosa says something is very wrong with this text. Yeah, in fact it is, but uh, I, I want us to understand the tendencies behind that. The problem is not the text itself. The problem is that these qualities are perceived as praiseworthy. And you have come with me all this way through this other chapter where we met Sariputta, how he is described, the type of qualities he symbolizes. And now you meet this and you see the difference. Robert, the fact that he did not teach lay followers, novices, bhikkhunis indicates that the authors of the sutta want to strengthen an in-group, something like a group of male elite monks. Yeah, but um, Robert, even to be male elite monks, maybe this is the next topic. No, it's topic of invitation. Let me just quickly go on. I just jumped the others just to reply to Robert. You see, at least according to the Pali version, <coughs> he also did not collaborate in maintaining the male monastic order. He never, you see, to become a bhikkhu, you need to give, somebody has to give you the going for to become a novice. And somebody has to give you the full in, uh, uh, ordination, and you also need to take dependence. So for him, these things somebody else must have done, but at least according to the Pali version, he never reciprocated, even on that aspect. The, we don't have these qualities in the Madhyama Agama, though. Anyhow, let me... There's the topic of invitations that he always went uh, to take arms, to beg for arms, which is, I think, is a praiseworthy quality. But here, the topic that most of you have already commented on, his attitude towards women. Never looked at a woman's face, never entered a nunnery, never greeted a nun, never taught females. This is precisely this, uh, this, this idea that it is praiseworthy that, uh, Say I am. If if I want to, like, okay, uh, let me let me start. Uh, as a Buddhist monk, I obviously depend on the offerings of laity, and I have to. Uh, 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 it's part of my job as a monk to behave in a proper way. And now, if uh, the general idea of proper behavior is that I I shun women, that I have to avoid women as much as I can, then if I do not behave like this, I become a a, a not praiseworthy monk. So these this, this ideas are very important because they show us the beginning of certain tendencies that are a problem still nowadays. It is correct that as a young and newly ordained monk, I should not be mixing with women, obviously. And as a young and newly ordained nun, I should not be mixing with males. There is much uh, of wisdom in that, and we get instructions by the Buddha that one should not be getting close to women, and if you speak to women, be very careful, be mindful of what you do. But it is a different question when this is becomes praiseworthy qualities of an arahant. See, the Buddha, uh, he freely dealt with women. He had this this Ambapali, uh, she was a prostitute, and he accepted her gift of a park. He went to her house for meals. He had no problem with that. That, that is the point, that when this becomes associated not with a stage of training for one who is still fighting sensual desire, but as a mark of the one who is perfected, 
there it becomes problematic, I think. Let me see the comments. <laughs> Rosa, it goes to external aspects only, as it happens in all religions when they become corrupted. Yeah, it, there's, there, there, there is another very keen observation, Rosa. It is really, the whole thing is on external aspects of conduct. There's, we don't hear about his mindfulness, his concentration, his wisdom, whatever. All this is a display of faultless ascetic conduct uh, considered praiseworthy. Lisa, was he a Buddhist or just a random ascetic who came and showed off at the monastery on the day of his Nibbana? Well, he's obviously being presented as a Buddhist monk for 80 years. Juliana, <coughs> where is the Dhamma in this discourse? Is there any left in spite of the ideological development and the tendencies we see? Was it was the what is the core teaching? Perhaps besides the exaggeration, there's a genuine intention to state and encourage that there are arahants in this world. And Rosa says, if there is an arahant, I will not be a Buddhist. <laughs> yeah. So I have already touched on the teaching. He has the taking care. He never got sick. It's the only thing that we... And he never took medicine. And he never leaned against the support. This is actually, yeah, I think I've gone through most of my topics. The interesting thing is that in the list of outstanding disciples, Bakula is foremost in health. It's also very curious. We have this listing of outstanding disciples in Anguttara Nikaya and Ekotarika Agama. And, uh, and there we get who is foremost in mindfulness, in wisdom, in all this, and he's foremost in health. This is kind of a quality that has nothing really to do with him being a Buddhist or a practitioner. And there's a very cute story that comes in the Divya Vadana, <coughs> the Ashoka Vadana. It's a little later work of the Mula Savastivada tradition. And uh, uh, it's a story about King Ashoka. And uh, so King Ashoka is taken to a tour uh, where he can see stupas of different outstanding disciples. And so he gets the stupa of Mahakashyapa and Mahamogalan and Sariputta and Ananda and each time he makes a very substantial donation, big, big bag of gold pieces. And then there's also a stoop of Bakula. And uh, Ashoka is told that Bakula was outstanding for his health and for never having given any teachings. <laughs> so Ashoka just gives one small coin <laughs> to the stupa. <laughs> and those around him are surprised. And he says, uh, I find this monk not at all inspiring. He didn't teach anybody. And I, 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 I mean, one thing is I, I find, uh, I, 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 I read some humor in this description. And I find it interesting not only that King Ashoka is not inspired by Bakula, but also the fact that he's mentioned at all is interesting. Because the other monks mentioned are very famous disciples, but Bakula only comes up this one time. And so by the time this story came into being, it seems that Bakula was better well known than in early Buddhism. And this is precisely what I think is uh, the, the case, that what Rosa already pointed out, that uh, uh, we get here a praise of externals, of ascetic conduct, without emphasis on the inner qualities, with very little emphasis on inner qualities. And um, this apparently is, uh, and, and I, I propose that we see here the beginning of a shift in the Arahan conception. That what we saw in the first chapter that we read during earlier lectures of this course is a very different Arahan ideal. There is somebody very warm, caring, open, engaging, struggling with being wrongly accused, going all out of his way to visit a lay person just to give him a teaching. And this Arant here is uh, one, it's a quite a different Arant idea. So the main point we can get from this discourse, I think, is a, is a shift in the Arahant ideal. And uh, to understand for us that this Arant ideal has been important in tradition, and it sometimes informs even modern day conceptions of what an ideal monk should be or behave like. 
Rosa Grau asked, uh, uh, would you read it as a parody? I, I, I think the discourse is meant to be taken serious. Uh, I don't think it is meant as a parody. I think the King Ashoka story, that could be humor. And, uh, but uh, the story, the, the discourse itself, uh, the, the things that uh, convey to me a sense of humor in early discourse are different. If King Lisa, if King Ashok only gave a coin, it almost supports the theory that it is to be taken as a parody. Yeah, the, the Ashoka story does not mention the Bakula Sutta. It just has this bare fact that uh, he 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 was very healthy, and he didn't teach anybody. So the Ashoka thing, I think there's humor in there, but the Bakula Sutta, I am not sure if we can put if we can see humor in there I, as far as I can see especially this repetition by the reciters who always keep saying this is a marvelous quality this is a marvelous quality and also the context before they come the marvels of the Buddha the marvels of Ananda um, yeah I doubt Rosa it is clearly making fun of monks yeah the Ashoka story uh, Hugo asked if we are able to date the creation of this discourse. Well, um, we can only say that there is internal evidence, obvious evidence that he's 80 years, that this must be later, but it must still be relatively early as we have parallel versions that show that even though there are a number of differences, there is a common core there. So uh, I would... Uh, yeah, putting dates is a little difficult, but I would say maybe two centuries maximum after the Buddha's passing away. Rosa says, sorry, but I do not fully agree with you on this one, Bhante. Well, then please state uh, where there's disagreement. We have come, gone already beyond time, but uh, I think the discussion is important. So, I mean, as long as you want to continue and those who are getting tired can switch off. Juliana, usually in the discourses there are parodies of some gods or outside ascetics, but not really of insiders. Uh, yes, there's a small story where I think even insiders are being parodied, but it's not important now. John Emmer, but is there any evidence of irony in other suttas? I find even modern Indians and Sri Lankans to be lacking in a sense of irony compared to what I'm used to in America. I think there are instances of irony, and I've written on that in some of my articles. I can I can send them to you. I just note it down. <clears throat> Usually, irony and humor uh, come in the context of stories from the past. So I think there's there's a whole current of scholars arguing that stories like the creation of the world in Aganya Sutta the motive of the uh, universal ruler, the Chakravati, etc., are, 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 uh, there's, uh, there's some irony in there, some humor in there, and I think they are right. I think they are right. I have uh, written on that in relation to the Chakravati and also in relation to Chakra, Sakka, the, the god of the 33. Listen. Do you see this as a major turning point in the ideal followed by later discourse that developed this ideal further? Yes, I do see this as a major turning point in the Arahant ideal. I do. I think this is quite different. And it is this ideal what then also by other later tradition is being criticized. The Hinayanis, the self-centered Arahant. And as long as they talk about the Bakula type of Arahant, they're actually right. This is a person who is, uh, if he would not be an Arahant, we would have to say he is self-centered, just caring about himself. And all the ideal of perfection is being reduced to an outer display of ascetic conduct. But it is a, it is a mistake to think that this type of uh, presentation is representative of the Arahant ideal in early Buddhism in general. A major misunderstanding, and I hope uh, you would agree with me on that, having gone with me through the Sariputta descriptions. 
rules about this may be just an exception the canon it is uh, exceptional in the canon and it is surprising as hugo said to to find it at this early stage usually within the early discourses we find only the first traces of developments that become more explicit later on Robert, <clears throat> the important point I take from this is the shift of the ideal of an Arahant. The fact that Ajahn Brahm got into trouble for attaining the ordination of Bhikkhunis, I don't know the details, shows that these views have an influence on Buddhism still today. Um, the problem in this particular issue is somewhat more complex because Ajahn Brahm was part of a particular monastic tradition who had decided not to have that, so it would have been, uh, uh, he would have needed the permission as a representative of their group to do that. It's a little bit like if you are, uh, say, part of a certain group of Tai Chi students, officially recognized as representing a particular teacher, and then you do something that has not been agreed is against what the whole group wants to do, then the whole group says, you're no longer part of us. So even though I, I think it's wonderful that he did it, uh, the fact that he was excluded from their group, from their perspective, is understandable. But this is a different topic. But the problem of Bikuni order is reordination is also somewhat complex, and we cannot reduce it to this. But one of the aspects is uh, definitely uh, the, in German we call it the Berührungsangst, the fear of contact with females. Uh, that sometimes goes with the uh, ideal of the good monastic. Uh, Akinjana, if Bakala was a monk for 80 years, the sutta must be after the Buddha. But yeah, we said that before. It definitely must have been come into being. <coughs> Rudit Salina, I have heard that only thing what motivates Aran to live is to teach Dharma. Yeah, I, I think teaching Dharma is a very important aspect of the conduct of an Arahant, and some Arahants may do this less, they may live a secluded life. Uh, but uh, an Arahant who stays in the middle of the monastic community would have chances to do that. Anyhow, we are almost 10 minutes over time, so I'm, I'm glad for this uh, very uh, enlivening exchange we had. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, nothing I said in the course of presenting my views on this discourse has been experienced by anybody as a denigration or a, a aggressive kind of teaching. I'm Because I am very much uh, with my heart in this kind of thing, I might have said things a little bit too strong. In that case, I apologize. And I look forward to seeing you again.